got the definition of reign, and reign means to show sovereign power for a particular time period. And we think about uh, kings or monarchs or, or queens, and they may reign for tw 10, 20, 30, 40 years for some of them, maybe 50 if you're pushing it. But don't you know we have a king that has reigned in the past, a king that is reigning today, a king that will be reigning tomorrow for all eternity, and his name is Jesus. Can you say that name, Jesus? Say it again. Oh, there's beauty in that name, the name of Jesus. And as we talk about power all through scripture, we see the power of the Lord. And one particular uh, story, many of us might know it, is from Genesis 41. And Pharaoh at the time had a dream. And he asked all of his magicians and all of his wise men, quote unquote, to interpret this dream, and they could not. And then one of them said, I believe there's a young man by the name of Joseph that's in prison who has been known to interpret a dream or two. So they get Joseph out of prison in front of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, I hear you can interpret dreams. Here's my dream. Please interpret it. And Joseph looks at Pharaoh, and he said, you might be mistaken, Pharaoh. I cannot do anything of that nature. But I know one who has all the knowledge, one who has all the insight, one who has all the power, one who can do things that men and women cannot, one who just called me out of prison to be here in front of you, and his name is the Lord God Almighty. And the rest of that story, as many of us might know, is that Joseph was put in second in command because God gave him the ability to interpret that dream. Why do I share that story? Because number one, we're here at church watching online or here live, but it's amazing that Joseph was in prison and then was called out. And we're human. Maybe you have a prison of your own. I know I've had my prisons, things that are locked up, things that you feel like you're still involved with. And if it's not for you, maybe it's for a family member, maybe it's for a spouse, maybe it's for a child, maybe it's a co-worker, maybe it's someone, maybe it's your neighbor, but a prison representing something that it feels still locked, like you cannot break that lock, you cannot get out. Well, God can not only open a lock, but he could break down the doors if he wanted to. So we serve a God who can do the impossible. So maybe there's something for you or someone else that just seems locked up. Raise your hand if you are praying for God to release that. Just raise your hand right now. There you go. That's what we're going to do. This is why we come to church, because we worship God and the benefits of worshiping God. And because of his great love, he delights to save us as his children. So hands all up. We're going to pray for breakthrough with those locks and in that prison. Dear God, we come this morning. Lord, we started off this message with just worshiping you, God. And every day we desire to worship you. But right now, Lord, Father, as we lift up our hands, Lord, we are requesting, Lord. Lord, we're requesting for you to, Lord, call out those things, Lord, individuals or those things, Lord, that are for us, that are locked up, that are in prison, that have four walls, Lord, holding it back. Lord, you are the God, Lord, that can knock walls down. You can open doors that no man can close. You are that God, the only God who can do that. So, Lord, whatever it is that we've brought in, whatever it is that, Lord, is in our minds, whatever it is that's even keeping us or someone else locked in, God, we pray to open. Open those doors. Lord, destroy the doors or just call out. Just like Joseph was called out of prison and was in front of the king, Lord, call us out or others out of that prison door. Lord, that we can stand in front of you and just like Joseph say, I'm no one, but I know of someone. 
And Lord, we praise you this morning for that. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let it, us give praise to God this morning. It's a good morning to praise God. You may have a seat. Wow, just looking out, what a beautiful crowd. If no one told you you look beautiful, you all look beautiful this morning. We don't know about the afternoon, but today you all look beautiful watching online. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this morning, uh, Pastor Rick is ministering uh, at another church here. He uses his gift to do that. Uh, but not to worry, we have Pastor Darian, our worship leader, who's going to give a great word this morning. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Here are a few other announcements. Good morning. My name is Annie. Thank you so much for joining us for church. We're so excited to see our church continue to grow. If you're new to Family Christian Center Church, we want to say welcome and that we're so glad you're here. If this is your first time visiting us in person, we have a gift for you at our welcome area in the lobby. If you're watching online, you can comment in the chat and we'd love to hear from you. You can also visit our website at FCCLive.com to learn more about our church and what we offer for your family. We can't wait to get to know you. Now today and every Sunday, we are excited to invite your kids to jump for free with us after service. You will find an indoor trampoline park next door called Sky Zone. For over 10 years, Sky Zone has been serving our community by creating a fun and safe environment for your students to enjoy. You can plan to bring your whole family to jump for free. We'll take care of the socks and everything. We can't wait to jump with you today. Middle school and high school students, this Tuesday at 7 p.m., we invite you to join us at Shockwave. Shockwave is the student ministry of Family Christian Center Church. We have weekly services every Tuesday at 7 p.m. At Shockwave, you can experience an environment where you can make great friends, hear a message that speaks directly to your life, and participate in dynamic worship. If you have any questions, you can connect with a team member in the lobby directly after service or drop a comment in the chat. We can't wait to see you there. Now let's get ready for the final message from the Walking with Jesus series. Well, good morning, family. How's everybody doing? You feeling good? Doing good? Come on, happy that God is alive. And if you're watching online, how are you doing? Everybody feeling good today? Isn't it an awesome day to be alive? Come on, I had an awesome time, and I just felt led to do this. I had an awesome time worshiping. Uh, don't you just appreciate the worship team? That's right. I can say that. That's my team. Aren't they incredible? But it's more than that. It's, it's their heart and their surrender to God that produces that. It's not about talent. Know this in your life. It's not the talent that opens the doors. It is submission to God that opens doors for us. But while they were singing that, you reign. Well, they sang it over and over. And every time they said forever. I don't know about you, but I've received strength. I started to receive strength. And I wanted to talk about that for just a second because he reigns over everything. Come on, you ought to just, just put your hands out like you're receiving something right where you sit. Lord, you reign over everything. Over sickness, you reign. Over disease, you reign. Over my home, you reign. Over my family, you reign. Over my finances, you reign. Over rent prices, Jesus reigns. Over my mortgage payment, come on, he reigns. Over slipping transmissions and misfiring engines, he reigns. 
over your air conditioning unit. It's getting hot. He reigns. Come on, we laugh about it, but he really reigns over this. He's in control. Just receive that this morning, that everything that you're dealing with, Jesus reigns. Nothing can stand against him. Whatever you're facing, Jesus reigns. I don't know what that is. I, I, I had a couple things written down. But I don't know what you're facing, but whatever it is, Jesus reigns. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what problems you have. You might be in some trouble, legal trouble. Let me tell you, one of the easiest things to do in life is make a mistake. That's okay. Jesus reigns. He reigns today. Amen, church? Come on, you received that this morning? Come on. All right. We had to do that. We had to stop right there and do that. Before we get started, because y'all know I'm rearing to go. I'm fired up. Y'all know it. But before we get started, how many love your pastors? Come on. How many love your pastors? Pastor Rick and Pastor Becky Van Wagner, incredible visionaries. Uh, They've sown and sown and sown for years. And we are reaping the fruits of their labor. And I believe, church, if we put our minds together and we walk in unity, I believe we can accomplish something great in our community. Amen, church? Come on, no disunity. We declare unity in this house in Jesus' name. Amen? Love our pastors. All right. (laughs) We're ready to go. If you're ready for the word, shout yes. Here we go. As you heard on the announcements, I have the honor of completing the Walking with Jesus series. Today's title is Walk It. Like you talk it. Walk it like you talk it. Come on, you can't talk the talk if you ain't gonna walk the walk. Come on, don't talk, don't talk the talk if you can't walk the walk. What good is a man without his word? What good is a woman without her word? If you say it, do it. If Jesus says it, it is happening. Walk it like you talk it. So today, we're gonna take a look at Jesus. And what happened after the resurrection. So sometimes we get in cycles as believers and we think that the Bible ends when the tomb is empty. Okay, maybe the the movie The Passion of the Christ, it ends there. (laughs) But the Bible does not end with the tomb being empty. Matter of fact, Jesus did more things after he left the tomb. So today we're going to take a look at the things he did afterward, and we're going to find out how Jesus walks it like he talks it. Are you ready for the word? Come on. Here we go. Here we go. Acts 1-3 tells us that after the resurrection, there was a period of 40 days in which the risen Jesus appeared to his disciples. If he was here, what was he doing? He appeared to over 500 people. For the 40 days that Christ continued to reappear on earth, Scripture tells us what he was doing. So let's look at what he was doing. Before that, though, early on, Jesus speaks about his death and his resurrection. He makes mention of this, referring to Jonah in Matthew 12. Let's read some Scripture. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, We want to see a sign from you. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Right? So Jesus has already declared this is what's going to happen. He also makes mention of his resurrection when he was inside the temple. I'm at John chapter 2. Let's read scripture. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, don't you love religious people? They replied, it has taken us 40 years, brother man, to build this temple. 46 years. And you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. I love this. So Jesus is telling them this is exactly 
how it happens, and Jesus is a man of his word. All right, here we go. Number one, Jesus left the tomb but made sure to fold his cloth. Okay, so the tomb is now empty. Okay, scripture says this. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Okay, so I want to track with you on what's happening. So the tomb is empty, all right? And up until this point, no one has raised himself from the dead. Now, Jesus has raised other people from the dead, but no one has raised himself from the dead. So when they walk into the tomb and they see this thing empty, the first thought that comes to their mind is somebody has robbed the body. Somebody's stolen his body. And this would have been normal, and I say the word normal very loosely because it's not normal to steal anybody's dead body, but this would have been normal because Jesus had fanatical followers. So upon his death, it could happen that some people would, would form a plot to go steal his body. But when they walk in the tomb and they see the linen lying there and they see the cloth lying there, it suggests that no one could have stolen its body because while the cloth is folded, it means Jesus left intentionally. He did not leave on happenstance. He left intentionally suggesting that he would be back because the cloth was folded, okay? So he was leaving a clue to whoever was going to walk into the temple that he left and nobody stole his body. He left because that's what he said he was going to do, amen, church? So when they got there, Jesus was leaving a clue of hope because God bless, come on, the tomb is empty. Can we not celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty? Come on, Jesus died, but he's not still dead. He walked right out of that grave. Come on, every religion has a tomb, but only one of them is empty. That's our king. Amen, church? So he leaves the cloth there as to tell people who found him, oh, no, no, I left and I walked out out of my own power. But understand this, people who were there had no idea that he had left. So when they see the tomb empty, they're thinking, we don't really understand what's going on. All they know is Jesus has died. And sometimes, listen, that's you and I in our life, where something has happened or something, we're, we're in a moment of despair and we're looking for God and we can't find him, yet God is leaving clues. But we're looking so naturally at our situation that we've missed the fact that God is setting us up to prosper if we'll only open our eyes to see what God is doing in our lives. Stop praying and expecting to receive the answer immediately. Okay, I'm going to park it right here. I'm going to park it right here. First two services didn't get this. <laughs> Stop praying and expecting the fullness of the answer immediately. It's irresponsible. I want to say that again. I love when it's quiet. <laughs> I love that. Stop praying and expecting God to give you the fullness of the answer immediately. It's irresponsible. Would you let your nine-year-old kid drive a car? No. Maybe some of us shouldn't be driving cars. There's a process in order to receive promise. Listen to this. God don't want to give you your future only to have you squander it. I want to tell this to you. I want to tell this to you in love. I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to me. God doesn't want to give me everything I'm asking for if I'm going to lose it. Sometimes there's a process where we have to look at the clues. We have to see, okay, I, I see God moving a little bit here. I see him moving a little bit here. I don't have the fullness of what I want, but I can see that God is beginning to work things out on my behalf. And when you see God working things out, it ought to give you a boost to your faith to say that what I'm praying for and what I'm asking for is coming when I'm ready. Amen, church? I started to say, Lord, I don't even want everything right now. I want to make sure I'm at the maturity level to receive it. 
He's leaving clues for us. He's opening small doors. It's, I know your business is not, not a billion, maybe you got a billion dollar business. I know it's not there yet. It doesn't mean God's not going to do it for you. Keep walking, keep moving, analyze the clues that God is leaving to tell us he's with us. Amen, church? Number two, here we go. He reveals himself to Cleopas on the road to Emmaus. Okay, now this is very significant. Let's read scripture, Luke 24. As they talked and discussed these things, he's talking about Cleopas with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, now look at this. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know about the things that have happened there in these days? And look at Jesus' response. Look, if you don't think God has a, a sense of humor, you should just read the scriptures. Look at Jesus' response. What things? Oh, come on, man. He's the one who died and got up. Jesus saying, what, what things, he asked. They said, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. That scripture is really significant. One phrase, we had hoped hoped. It's letting us know that at the time, all hope was lost. Now, I want you to read the scriptures in context because today we have the advantage of having the full story. We know that Jesus went to the cross. We already know he went to the grave. We know he got up with all power and authority. We know he's given us dominion, but back then, all they knew was he died. Read it in context. Think about this. The man you've been following your whole life, you done left your whole life behind to follow this man who says he has the words to everlasting life, to follow this man who has healed lepers, he's healed the blind, he's healed the sick. You've seen him do miraculous things, and then he dies. The man you had put all your hope, all your trust, all your faith in, you believed in him, you followed him, you walked after him, he fed you when you didn't have any food. I'm talking about Jesus here, and he dies. They didn't have newspaper. There's no such thing as going to Google and said, is the tomb empty? There was no such thing back then. They just knew they saw him on the cross, they saw him hang his head and die, and they saw him buried. That's all they knew. Can you imagine the feeling of hopelessness? The Bible says that after this, Cleopas, they kept walking with Jesus as he taught them the scriptures. And they asked him, still not knowing who he was, they asked him, will you stay with us tonight? And so Jesus had dinner with them. And then the Bible says that they were revealed to see that that was Jesus. And Jesus vanished. But think about the situation. All hope is lost. Despair. It's all gone. It's all over. Think about that. No, that sounds like me and you. You ever been in a situation just seem hopeless? Even though God's done already told you he has plans for you to prosper, he's already told you he'll never leave you nor forsake you, but in the moment of despair, you feel all alone. Have you ever been through something in your life that's been so tough, so hard? You have people speaking bad on your name. You've lost loved ones. You've lost jobs. And even though you know the promises of God, you still feel alone. These are the disciples. This is Cleopas. This is everyone in this region. But God is a God of hope. Amen, church? Here we go. Number three. Number three, Jesus reveals himself to the disciples. Okay, so we got number one, Jesus folds his cloth. Number two, he reveals himself to Cleopas. Number three, now he's revealed himself to the, to the disciples. Now, Cleopas 
is speaking with the disciples on what just happened. After Jesus vanishes, the Bible says Cleopas went to Jerusalem and he, he walked up on the 11, which were the disciples. And now they're talking about what's happening. Let's read scripture. Luke 24, from verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Listen to this. The disciples walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, heard all the teachings, knew the scripture, knew that the Messiah had to die. Jesus already told them that he would be raised from the dead, that he would live again. And the disciples are startled that Jesus is among them because they still don't believe the very word of God. And I come to encourage you today because if you're doubting God, that's okay. Because the disciples who walk with Jesus still doubted his very word. Don't feel any shame that at times you felt a little bit lost. Don't feel at any point, don't feel any shame that at a certain time you felt like God had left you. Because the, the disciples right here are letting us know that even when Jesus says it to us, man, it's a whole different situation when the despair hits your heart. Come on, is there anyone in here that's been in some tough situations and thought, I don't know how this is happening? Anyone in here been in some tough situations and thought, I don't know how God is going to get me out of this one? Even though we know the scriptures, even though we know God is for us, he has plans for us to prosper, that doesn't mean we won't go through trials. There is no testimony without a test. Matter of fact, we ought to just say, Lord, I'm thankful for the test. Some of this wisdom I have, I'd have never gotten it had you not tested me like you did. We ought to be thankful for the test because God's trying to teach us something. But Jesus has to tell him, look at this, look at the next scripture, Luke 24, 44. Jesus has to tell him, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Lord, will you open our minds this morning so that we can understand the scriptures? Lord, will you open our hearts so we can hear you and understand you? Jesus is telling them, I already told you this is what's going to happen. But that's not enough for us sometimes. Listen, I'm with you. I understand that in trials, it's really hard to see how God is going to bring us out on the other side. But the Bible says we've overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony, which means that every test that you go through, oh, it will be used for the glory of God. The trials that you face, the things that's going on in your life, it is not that God wants to hold you down. It's that God wants to bring you up. This test will be a testimony. Number four, Jesus reveals himself at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, before this time period, the Sea of Tiberias is known as the Sea of Galilee, so it's the same place. The Bible says this, early in the morning, John, I'm in John 21, verse 4, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Now, look, the, the context here is they've been fishing all night. So they're frustrated. They, they've had no fish. They said, no. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Oh man, what a mighty God we serve that can turn a moment of despair into triumph. Come on, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Oh, we've been, we've been working all night. We've been trying all night, but joy, I'm telling you, joy is coming. Receive it, church. Joy is coming. It's coming to your household. Come on. And so 
they see Jesus on the shore. And this is the Sea of Galilee. And we're talking about Peter here, right? The Bible says that Peter, after this, jumped out of the boat, after they caught all his fish and swam the shore, realizing it was Jesus. This is the same Peter that has all the zeal and the fervor. This is Peter, right, the strongest of all the disciples, the most zealous of all the disciples. Peter, right? This is the same Peter that would kill for Jesus. I mean, loved Jesus so much. This is the guy who wanted to walk on water so bad. He saw Jesus out there. He stepped out onto the water and he began to sink. And the Bible said, he said, Lord, save me. And he was saved. That Peter, the one who's excited. Now, it's also the same Peter that does the unthinkable. I want to track back in the story, the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter was among him. And when they took him, the Bible says, when they took Jesus, Peter followed a distance behind those when they arrested Jesus. And the Bible says that they stopped at a certain place and Peter sat down with the people at a fire. And the Bible says that somebody recognized Peter. Oh, maybe you've heard this story before. And they said, I know you were with Jesus. He's one of them. Wait a minute. I'm reminded, didn't Jesus tell Peter, tonight you're going to deny me three times? Tonight, you're going you're gonna to deny me three times. Peter, the zealous one, there ain't no way, Lord. I know you're talking about Thomas. I know you're not talking about me. Lord, no, it's you. You're going to deny me three times. Okay, so here we are, and somebody's asked, and they say, I know you were with Jesus. You know what Peter says? You can't be talking about me. It wasn't me. I wasn't with him. First question. Then the Bible says somebody else looked at him and said, no, that's him because he sounds like Jesus. That's him. You know what Peter does? No, you're not talking about me. I was not with this guy. I was not with him. Okay, now, of course, Peter's doing this because if they find out he was with them, they're going to kill him. So Peter is saving his life here. And then the Bible says somebody for a third time said, no, I know it's you. He's a Galilean. That's Jesus. He was with Jesus. You know what Peter does for a third time? No, it wasn't me. How many times I got to tell y'all that's not me? And that was the third denial. Peter has done the unthinkable, the unreasonable, the unbelievable. Something he felt like he would never, ever do. He's done it. Now, after Jesus is resurrected, they're on the shore, and they brought all this fish, and they've had a meal. And now let's read some scripture. Look at this. John 21. Y'all stay with me on this. This is so good. John 21, verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon Son of John, do you love me more than these? Talking about the disciples. Peter responds, yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Two, again, Jesus said for the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. Then a third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Look at this. The Bible says Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. 
Doesn't that sound familiar? Three simple questions. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three simple questions. Weren't you with Jesus? Weren't you with Jesus? Weren't you with Jesus? And I realized Jesus was reminding Peter of what he had done in the past. Those three questions. Three times. You're going to deny me three times. And then Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? He's reminding Peter of something tragic that has happened in the past. Peter has done the unthinkable. He's done the unbelievable. Come on, can you not raise your hand in here and say, it's me. I've looked in the mirror sometimes and thought to myself, how did I get here? Come on. Have you ever thought to yourself, I've done something I thought I would never do? Come on. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said, how is this me? Have you ever said something you thought, that sounds nothing like me? Come on, am I the only one in here that's gone through something and looked in the mirror and said, I can't believe I did that? And this is Peter. Peter's being reminded of shame. Why would Jesus be doing that? Why would he be reminding Peter of what's happened in the past? Church, we come to find out that the translation, Jesus says, feed my lambs. He's talking about young people, lambs. And then he says, take care of my sheep. He's talking about older people. And then he says, feed my sheep spiritually. And Peter becomes responsible for establishing the modern church. This very institution, Peter, alongside Jesus, established the church. Church, I realized this is a story of redemption. What was so important for Jesus? Imagine this. What would Peter's legacy have been? Peter would have went the rest of his life. The Bible says that after he denied Jesus, he wept in sorrow. He wept. And that would have been Peter's legacy. It wasn't, it wouldn't have been that Peter was, was zealous and, and had fervor. It would have been that Peter denied Jesus in the most crucial moment. But Jesus came to change that legacy. Oh my goodness. What this means for you and I. God is a God who wants to restore you. Even after you've done the unthinkable, the unbelievable, or you've not gone too far for God to redeem you today. Number five, and I'm closing here. Jesus ascends to heaven and sends the disciples out. Let's read scripture, Matthew 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Church, this is a story of redemption. Peter's done the unthinkable. Peter has done something unbelievable. But God used that test to form a testimony. I'm like Peter. He's done the unthinkable. Said the unbelievable. Shocked 
But today, Jesus is not allowing my legacy to be my past. My legacy is restoration and redemption. Or oh, you've not done something too bad that God can't restore you. I told the last service, y'all better be so glad I'm not the Messiah. Because if I was Jesus, I'm not saying a word to Peter. Matter of fact, there's one person I don't want to see is Peter. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Just imagine the person you love so much betrays you. The human nature in us says, vengeance, get my revenge. I'm going to let you know who's in charge. But the spirit says, come. The spirit says, restoration. Jesus is not interested in shaming you. He doesn't want you low. Matter of fact, redemption for you is free. There's no qualification. You don't got to be the smartest one in the room. Some of y'all are like, but I am the smartest one in the room. I feel you. You don't got to be the most beautiful person in the room. You don't got to be the most wealthy one in the room. There's no cost for redemption. It's free. There's only one thing we have to do. And that's accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. This message touches me because I am Peter. The God did not have to redeem me. He didn't have to, but he did. And if he did it for me, and if he did it for Peter, and if he did it for John, and if he did it for Paul, he can do it for you today. Renew your faith in a God of restoration. I feel the weight. Just like the last service. I feel the weight of what some of you have carried. Some decisions you made, people that you've hurt, people who have hurt you. I feel it. I feel it. And I'm with you. I'm standing with you. But today you can walk out of here clean of shame. Because God's mercies and grace are free for us if we're willing to open up our arms and accept it. All you have to do is accept Jesus today. I want to pray with you. Lord, thank you so much. That you're a man of your word. That everything you spoke came true. Everything you said would happen, happened. And Lord, we know there are promises for us. And even those situations seem bleak. Even those situations seem dire and circumstances seem out of our control. Lord, they're not out of your control. We surrender our hearts to you today. Or some of us are struggling with things that have happened in the past. And we've been defined by so many bad decisions. But today we understand you're God who redeems us. And that we are not our past. Matter of fact, we're defined by your word. And your word says we are chosen. Your word says you have plans for us 
to prosper and have good success. And we're standing on your word today. Or some of us in here are wondering, how do I sign up for this free redemption? All you have to do today is accept Jesus into your heart. Maybe you've never done that. And maybe today you want to accept Jesus for the first time. I would love to pray with you. Or maybe you're in here and you've accepted Jesus before. But still, things are bothering you so bad. You're carrying a weight you were never designed to carry. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon him. Maybe today you're saying, I'd love to set aside this weight. I'd love to hit a reset. I'd love to hit a redo button. I would like to start fresh and clean today. Let me tell you, the Father's arms are open wide. I would love to pray with you as well. If you're in either one of those two groups, whether you want to accept Jesus for the first time or the first time in a long time, will you just boldly put your hand up so I can see who I'm praying for all over this room? Yeah, I see that hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see it. Yes. Yeah, come on. Up top, I see it. Yes. Come on. Come on. Yeah. 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 Come on. Raise it up high. I want to see who I'm praying for today. Yeah. Come on. It's a day of redemption. Come on. Come on. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's awesome. Will everyone say this prayer and repeat after me, but especially those who raised your hand. Will you say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again and that you're alive right now. So please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Change my life. Help me to be the person you want me to be. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, can you give it up for Jesus this morning? The God of restoration. You were just guided through the salvation prayer. And if you gave your heart to Jesus today, you have just made the best decision ever. We would like to connect with you to help guide you in your next steps with your relationship with Jesus. You can text FCC guest to 97000 to connect with our team. You'll fill out a connection card that will help us know you better. Now is the time in our service where we prepare to give our tithes and offerings. If this is your first time tuning in with us, please feel no obligation to give. This service is our gift to you. But if you call FCC your church and you want to participate in giving today, you can text FCC Give to 97000 or you can give securely online at FCCLive.com slash give. I'm going to take this time to pray over our offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of giving. It's a form of worship to you. We ask you to bless every giver in this place, every giver online. Bless their families, bless their lives, bless their jobs. We thank you that every gift given will grow your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like prayer today, you can text FCC prayer to 97000 and a member of our prayer team will reach out to you. Thanks for joining us for church today and have a great week.